and we're going. Hi, welcome to the New York City Category Theory Seminar. This week, Joshua Susson is talking about categorification and quantum topology. Uh, Josh, tell us about you. Okay, uh, first, thanks for the invitation. Um, so I, uh, I'm a math faculty at uh, Mega Evers College and at the Grad Center. Um, I studied undergrad at MIT, and then I was a grad student at Yale. Um, Igor Frankel was my supervisor. He's uh, one of the uh, founders of categorification. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you a little bit, give you an overview of this program. Um, just a couple of other words, and I'll mention this later. Um, I run the representation theory seminar at the Grad Center, which there might be some overlap in topics you might be interested in, so I could send some links later, and also the colloquium at Mega Evers. Um, I, yeah, I, so I, thanks. I, but in particular, Friday, you have a talk, an interesting talk, no? Uh, yes, so on Friday, there's a talk about um, quantum, quantum topology and some uh, interesting manifold invariants. So I, I'll put the link to the, uh, to the chat after, maybe after the talk into the oh, you send, send, send me as an email and I'll send oh. I'll send it out and then there's another one coming up also no right like. yeah and there's another uh, talk in our colloquium specifically about categorification that's in I think maybe early April and I'll send you out the, info, the information about that sounds good we'll send it out to everybody okay fire away okay thanks so um I'm gonna give kind of an overview about this I don't know everybody's background so there's going to be, you know, a bit of representation theory, a little bit of category theory, and some topology. So, you know, please interrupt me if you have any, uh, any questions. Okay, so first, um, maybe the first section, I'll be just give some overall motivation about things. So first, what is a quantum invariant? Now, this is a little bit vague, but maybe there's not a proper definition of this. So a quantum invariant. So this is an invariant of, um, of a topological object. And by topological object, what, I, what we usually mean in this area of, of topology are things like um, maybe like a link, which is you know, a knot with many components, or tangles, these are links with open components, open ends, boundaries, or maybe three manifolds. So those are topological objects which locally look like three-dimensional space, um, whose values but so these are, these are geometric or topological objects and they're hard to get a hold of. So you want to inside, assign some algebraic data to get a better feel for those things. And so the values of this algebraic data you assign to these um, are usually, um, well, in the case of links, they're often polynomials. In the case of tangles, the algebraic data we often assign are maps of vector spaces. In the case of three manifolds, they end up being complex numbers. And I'll be more specific about these things uh, in a few minutes. Um, so these are the topological inputs. Those are the algebraic outputs. And what is the machine which cranks these algebraic outputs, um, uh, which come from, this might be a run on sentence, um, the representation theory of um, quantum groups. Okay, um, where a quantum group, I'm, I'm, I'll be more specific about this in a few minutes, UQG, that's what we call a quantum group, that's the, the, the notation for a quantum group, um, is the quantum group associated to a finite dimensional simple Lie algebra G. Okay. Um, so the primary, the, you know, maybe the, the pioneering example of a quantum invariant is the Jones polynomial, J of L. So L is a link. And um, this machine spits out a polynomial, actually a, a Laurent polynomial. And one could have completely avoid the representation theory to define this as a very elementary description. Um, but conceptually, it's kind of in the way Jones essentially thought about it, that this comes from the representation theory of the simplest quantum group, um, UQSL2. So 
Um, SL2 is just the Lie algebra of two by two matrices whose trace is zero. Um, so it's the, one of the you know, kind of most basic Lie algebras that you could have. And it's interesting that you could already get um, some non-trivial, uh, you get non-trivial things coming from uh, um, this very basic Lie algebra, this quantum group. Okay. Are there any questions? I, I think I have to erase this board now to continue. I don't know how to scroll down without it. So, if anybody has used Blackboard before, because I've never used this, um, they know how to erase quicker or know how to scroll to another page, please let me know. Okay, so um, I'll, I'll describe in the next section a little bit more technically what I mean by UQSL2 and the Jones polynomial. Um, but still in this overview section, I now want to briefly touch on categorification, and I'll come back to that later on in the talk. Okay, and so now um, the motivation of categorification. And I'll come back to this again later. This is a program, and I'll, I'll mention again later due to Crane and Frankel. So it deals with the following situation. So you have something called um, well, JNL. This is a generalization of the Jones polynomial called the color Jones polynomial. Okay. It's, a, it's an invariant of links depending upon a positive integer n. And what was discovered um, soon after Jones's discovery of this link invariant is that this could actually be upgraded to a manifold invariant. This is a this could be upgraded to a you know, Witten, Rashid, and Tarayev invariant. Z of M three of a three manifold M, and so Witten discovered this. Um, he had a, churn, uh, a description from quantum field theory, a, very, a physical description, which got him a Fields Medal. Then Rashtikin and Tarayev had a more rigorous um, reinterpretation in terms of quantum groups. And um, so, you know, it's a little mysterious. On the left hand side, I have an invariant of a link. And on the right hand side, I have an invariant of a three manifold. But it's a classical fact in topology that any three manifold could be realized by doing what's called surgery on a link. So to any three manifold, it comes from an underlying link. So this Jones polynomial or this color Jones polynomial could be upgraded to a three manifold invariant. And there is this, uh, I, I mentioned this UQSL2, there's this quantum parameter Q, which I'll discuss in a few minutes. It's necessary. So in the Jones polynomial, you could think of Q as just a formal parameter. You could also think of it as a, as a number, as a complex number. But normally, when you just think about link invariants, you think of it as a formal parameter. To make a manifold invariant, it's important that Q is a root of unity. So it's a special complex number, such so like q to the n for some n is equal to one. Okay. Now, so that's again this this uh, this this passage is you know late eighties, early nineties. This was the beginning of quantum topology, and then in the mid nineties, um, Igor Frankel and uh, Lewis Crane, they um, they wrote a paper introducing the idea of categorification, and well, I'll be you know kind of schematic here about it. There's this categorification, which I'll describe in more detail later. And roughly speaking, this um, color Jones polynomial, this is a, um, an invariant of links, which is a, a Laurent polynomial. Um, this gets upgraded to a homology theory of links. So maybe we call this JN tilde of L. This would be called something like color Jones homology. So it's a more sophisticated invariant. It's a, it's a homology theory. The relationship is that the Euler characteristic of this homology theory is the original Jones polynomial. Um, and it actually contains, well, they postulated this thing existed. And then um, Havanov actually constructed this um, color Jones homology um, in the later, late 90s, soon after Crane and Frankel introduced the program. So that's a categorification of the Jones polynomial. And now the, the, the big question, which has been open for maybe 20, 25 years in this field of categorification is, well, what about here? Is there something called the, like, is there a homology theory of three manifolds related to this witten russia tikhon triad invariant? This is 
this mathematically doesn't exist yet. Maybe some physicists have some idea of this. So this is not a rigorously defined thing. Um, and so what people have been trying to do is trying to upgrade or to this passage of taking color Jones homology and now cooking up a, uh, a sophisticated three manifold invariant of it, just the way it was done in the, in the um, late 80s, early 90s to cook up this, um, this decategorified um, witten russian deacon triad invariant. Now, what's the, uh, what's the purpose of this, of this game? Well, one thing you might just look at, first of all, it's just a nice kind of philosophical thing. Could you construct this homological invariant? Maybe it's more powerful, maybe it's a, a stronger topological invariant. But um, Crane and Frankel had, um, had something else in mind. Well, they had those things in mind, but they had a more, even a, a, a greater vision in mind. And this was the following, is that, um, you might have some four manifold, some four dimensional manifold. And the boundary of, these four, of this four dimensional manifold might be a three dimensional manifold down here, M3, and then maybe a different three manifold over here. So imagine I have some crazy four manifold whose boundary. Your, your lower manifold doesn't fit on the screen. You don't see the four manifold. Well, I see the four manifold, I just don't see the lower three manifold. Oh, this M, oh, you don't see this M3, I see. Okay, sorry. Um, I'll, I'll move that up a little bit. So here's my four manifold. I have my three manifold is one component of the boundary and maybe my three manifold N is the other component of the boundary. Okay, and if this witten reshetikin this witten reshetikin of homology really existed and it's really a truly a homological invariant that means there's certain functorial properties. And what would happen is that we view this W4 as, um, uh, as kind of a morphism between the, two th between the manifold M and the manifold N. So if we really have a functorial homology theory, we should be getting now a map, Z tilde of W4, from this hypothetical homology of M to this hypoth hypothetical homology of N. And it's Crane and Frankel's dream is that th this is now an invariant of four manifolds. So what they wanted to do is to upgrade this, um, this, this early 90s quantum topology machinery of three manifold invariants to a four manifold invariant and turn this into a three plus one dimensional TQFT. Um, but anyway, everything that I said in the last several minutes is still uh, mathematical fiction. Um, people are working on it, but um, that's, the, that's the overall goal. So that that so I'm Z, move into, that, that Z bar it should be m to the four is that the, is that the point uh, over uh, here uh, no, 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 you say W R T homology Z bar m and that's again m to the three or m to the four that's m to the three yeah okay yeah so yeah the point is that if we really have a homology theory of three manifolds and we assign some vector spaces to three manifolds and then to a four manifold which is whose boundaries are m and n you get an induced map from the homology of M to the homology of N. Again, this is all hypothetical. And that map would be hypothetically an invariant now of four manifolds. Is, uh, is, it, is it easy to say why, why this is so hard to do? I mean. Uh, yeah, so, um, so uh, yeah, for several reasons. One is that even just this construction took kind of a genius work of Havana, inventive work of Havana, just to even construct this link invariant. Um, Although, I mean, that was done 20 years and a lot of the work in the last 20 years in categorification is modifications of this. Um, the, the other real difficult part is this passage to taking Q to be a root of unity. What does that mean categorically? And at the very end of the talk, I'll talk about some work in progress, which is what I think about now, about what's going on here. Um, but essentially, what does it mean for yeah, what, what does it mean for this Q to be a root of unity categorically is not well understood. I mean, again, I should say that physicists, I don't understand the physics papers, they do have kind of, um, they have sophisticated constructions coming from string theory about these hypothetical things, but I mean, they're not, they're not really mathematically rigorous right now. Okay, good. Are there other questions? I'm going to come back to this idea of categorification and give some more, I mean, this is, Kind of already kind of sophisticated talking about three manifolds and four manifolds. I'll give more down to earth examples um, uh, maybe in the second part of the talk.
What exactly does it mean the inversion of the four manifold takes Z bar of M3 to Z bar of N3? Oh, what does this mean? That, what does, yeah, no, I mean, so the, 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 the point is, is that, um, so there is a category, there's a topological category, the category of three manifold, the objects are three manifolds and um, the morphisms are four manifolds. So this is called a cobordism category. And so you could view a, a morphism in the category between two, two manifolds M and N as a four manifold where that, the boundary of that four manifold is M union N. So that's some category. And then hypothetically, we have some other algebraic category. And this algebraic, this algebraic kind of transfer should be a functor. So we should have now a functor. So if double the morphism in one category, Josh, your, your, your voice is coming in a little strange. From Josh, oh, sorry. Josh, Josh. Uh, is it better? Move the computer a little uh, okay. Here. Yeah, okay, good. Now it's better. No, now you're. Okay, muted. yeah, sorry. I see now I'm getting a message. My internet was unstable. Sorry, my internet is unstable. I just got a message. Okay, now, now you're good. Uh, Okay, sorry again, my internet sometimes goes in and out. This happens when I teach. So if it goes bad for a minute, I'll be back very quickly. Okay. Okay, sorry. Um, I don't know if you heard the answer to the last question, but are there any other questions? No, that's it. Okay. So, um, so now I'm gonna talk about, uh, I'll come back to categorif categorification later. Um, I'm gonna talk about this kind of classical um, WRT stuff, Jones polynomial. Okay, so um, so now in this, this is really the first section which has actual real math in it. So this is about the Jones polynomial. Okay, so um, uh, UQSL2, this is this quantum group for SL2, so I'll give you a proper definition now, is an algebra defined over um, the field of rational functions in some parameter Q um, generated by um, a generator E, generator F, um, generator K, and its inverse, K inverse. And uh, it has relations. Um, so one is that um, K, E, K and E almost commute. And I should put a plus or minus one here, plus or minus one here, plus or minus one here. Um, K and F almost commute. Okay. And then the third relation is the mixed relation. Um, e F minus F E is K minus K inverse over Q minus Q inverse. And in a way which I could make precise, but maybe I'll do that later if you want. Um, if there's a way of taking, when you take Q to be one, you just get the algebra SL2 of traceless three by, traceless two by two matrices. So you could think of E as the matrix zero, one, zero, F as the matrix zero, one, zero. And well, I have to be a little bit more precise. I'll just write K is approximately the, this diagonal matrix. But so think of the, this UQSL2 as a deformation of two by two matrices, okay? And so the representation theory of UQSL2 is, uh, is somewhat simple. Um, so we let Vn be um, an irreducible representation with basis So it's an n plus one dimensional representation. Okay. So it has uh, n plus one basis vectors and um, the action, so it's a vector space, but it has more than just the vector space structure. It has an action of this algebra UQSL2. And the action is given by the following. Um, e applied to the vector VK is some multiple of VK plus one. 
I'll tell you what this quant this number in front means in a moment. Um, f of vk is the so-called lowering operator. It's some multiple of vk minus one, and k acts diagonally. So capital K acts diagonally on this basis. Um, so K of VK is 2K minus N times VK. Okay, and you could check that if you do, if you apply E then F and then, or F minus E, that's the same thing as applying K minus K inverse over Q minus Q inverse. So you really, it's, it's fairly elementary to check that you actually get um, uh, a representation of this, of this algebra. And the fact that it's irreducible just means that it has no subspace, no um, proper subspaces. Okay, um, and I should say what this, uh, this weird thing in front is, that's quantum K plus one. In general, quantum K, it's a, it's a so-called quantum number. It's just equal to Q to the K minus Q to the minus K over Q minus Q inverse. So if you plug Q is equal to one, you recover normal number K. So it's like that, it's, your denominator. What's, oh, I'm sorry, is it too low? Yeah, I have to remember not to draw too low. Uh, let me raise that. Um, quantum K is Q to the K minus Q to the minus K over Q minus Q. Inverse. Could you see that? Yeah, I lost the bottom of the Qs, but basically see it. Okay, I should, uh, I should draw a line so I know not to go beneath it. Was that, is that line that I just drew visible to everybody? No. Oh, but what about this? Pixels too low. Oh, that's, yeah, that's plenty visible. Okay, okay. So I'll, let me keep this line here so I know not to draw below it. I apologize for this. I've never used this, uh, this whiteboard program before. I don't know what my other program was uh, not working. Okay. Um, yeah, so, okay, so this is what EQSL2 is and um, it's irreducible representations. And now um, we have to do some more things with this. So um, what I want to do is I want to tensor up some representations. So I'll explain why that's a legal maneuver. Um, sorry, this is taking a long time. Okay. So this algebra UQSL2 is a Hopf algebra. I mean, that means several things. It's an algebra, it's a co-algebra, it has something called an antipode. The part that I need to focus on is the fact that it, there's a co-algebra structure um, without, without describing specifically what that means. Um, it's kind of like a dual of an algebra structure, but what's important is that um, if, if, you've, if you have representations of a Hopf algebra, you could take tensor products of representations and it still remains a representation. So UQ2, UQSL2 is a Hopf algebra. So tensor products of these irreducible representations, VD1, tensor dot, 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 VDR is a rep. It's no longer irreducible, but it's a representation of UQSL2. Okay, so you have a nice, um, tensor category of UQSL2 representations. Okay, oh, this is a representation of UQSL2. Okay, so I, I haven't spoke about any topology in the last several minutes, and now I'm, I'm working towards there, because I want to define the Jones polynomial using this, uh, these representations of UQSL2. So there are maps of UQSL2 modules, of UQSL2 wraps, um, so there's several types of um, uh, maps that I want to consider. So one of them I'll call suggestively this cat map. This goes from V1 tensor V1. Remember V1 is a two-dimensional representation. It's also called the natural representation of UQSL2 to just the ground field. This is the trivial one-dimensional representation. And um, for formulas, if you know, not that they're that important for just a talk, but um, if you wanted to compute things, you certainly need these formulas. Um, cap of V1 tensor V0 is minus Q inverse. 
kappa V0 tensor V1 is one. And then cap of V0 tensor V0 is cap of V1 tensor V1, which is zero. Okay. And so one could check that this map commutes with the action of UQSL2. So we call this a UQSL2 intertwiner. Okay. So this is a map from V1 tensor V1. That's a four dimensional representation into a one dimensional representation. And one could do a slight upgrade of this. I could introduce now a map cap IN. What is this cap in terms of the monoidal category, the tensor category of representations? Yeah, so what, one could view this as the uh, evaluation morphism in a tensor, in a, in, a, uh, like, oh, okay. in a rigid tensor category. Yeah, if you want to, yeah, if you want to use that, that language. I mean, I have to be a little careful because really V1 is self-dual, but you could view that as an evaluation morphism if that helps. Okay. Okay. And um, we could upgrade this map cap to have some decorations, V, sorry, cap I, I comma N, which goes from a tensor product now of N, N factors of V1 into V1 tensor N minus two. And what we could, and the way to think about this is that cap I N, it's the identity on almost all the tensor factors, except that it's a cap on the, the I and I plus first tensor factor and then it's an identity on all the others. So it goes, so it contracts on um, the I and I plus first into something just in the ground field. All right. There's, well, if you like the language of, of tensor categories, there's the dual of this, it's a co-evaluation map. And well, as a vector space C over itself, it's, it's, uh, it's generated by just the vector by just the, the vector of one. And so I just have to specify this cup map on, uh, on the vector one. And it's V1 tensor zero minus Q V zero tensor V1. And just like I did for the cap map, I can upgrade this now to a cup map from V1 tensor N into V1 tensor N plus two by just acting in the I and I plus first components. Okay, all right, and there's two more maps and then I could um, get back to some topology. Maybe I could s squeeze them over here. Down here. So there's um, a so-called crossing map. This goes from V1 tensor, V1 tensor V1 into V1 tensor V1. And um, there's various descriptions of this. The simplest thing to do right now is just to say that it's a combination of cup and cat maps. It's minus Q squared times the identity map, minus Q times the cup map composed with the cap map. So that's, um, that's a perfectly good definition of this. Um, if you're familiar with quantum groups, this comes from the universal R matrix of UQSL2. Um, if you like the language of braided tensor categories, this is a braiding on a, ten on a tensor category. Um, and this could be upgraded to a map I n going from V1 tensor n to V1 tensor n, where I just do this crossing map on the I and I plus first components. And then finally, there's another crossing map. Here, I just, I, the notation I'm using is slightly different and the definition is slightly different. And this too could be defined in terms of um, the cup and cap morphisms. Um, so this is equal to minus Q to the minus two identity, minus Q inverse cup composed with cap. And then we could just generalize this to crossing morphism going from V1 tensor N to V1 tensor N by doing this in the I and I plus first. Okay, so these are, um, these actually, well, well, the cup and cat maps actually generate all the morphisms in this category. Um, I want to clear the screen, so now I'm going to bring this back into, I'm about to, I'll be able to define the Jones polynomial now. One second, one second, one second. Before you clear the screen, um, you're, you're, for tensor product people, you're, you're defining the trace, right? Um, you mean how I define these cup and cat maps? Cat right. maps? They, they will get, become a trace? Is that, is that the point? So, so the, um, I mean, there is a, so there is a, 
Uh, you're at, so, okay. So there is a way of defining the Jones polynomial by thinking about traces on the category. Um, an equivalent way of doing this is just by viewing cap as a map from V1 tensor V2 to just the, the ground. So it is kind of like a trace. It's getting rid of, in the end of the day, if you're, cap, if you're doing all sorts of caps, then you've traced everything back into, the, into a vector space. Hmm. Yeah, uh, usually, sorry. usually if you if you take the if you want to take the trace i think you have to uh have an evaluation co-evaluation uh smashed uh, at the beginning and end of the map um to, to take a trace of uh, any kind of map so so is this equivalent will it be equivalent to a trace or no this this thing uh, i don't think it is right josh i don't know well i mean uh, so I one okay. I could say it like this. Um, if you want, so well, maybe, maybe I'll get back to this question in a, in a couple of minutes. Mm -hmm. Well, it'll, it'll be more natural to answer that. Okay, good. Thank you. Oh. All right. Um, All right, I'll address that last bit later. Okay, so now um, to get some topology back into this, so there are some elementary tangle diagrams. So um, I can make, so I'll, well, a tangle is um, a one dimensional object between a certain number of points in one boundary, a certain number of points in another boundary. And I'll give you an example in a moment, but um, any tangle could be made out of some elementary tangles. So there's um, the following elementary tangle where I have a bunch of strands like this, and then I have just kind of that cap. That's really, this is a topological, this is a, a really a graphical thing. Um, but the point of course is that um, I want to associate some algebraic data to this. So if I have maybe n points on the bottom, n boundary points on the bottom, one through n, this is the i and i plus first things. Um, given all the algebraic machinery we set up, it's very natural now to assign some algebraic data to this. So I could associate um, the map cap i n from v1 tensor n to v1 tensor n minus 2. So I read my, my diagrams from bottom to top. Okay, so I have n points on the bottom. n points on the bottom um, tell, this is what Rishi Chicken and Tarayev say. They say associate a representation of UPSL2, some tensor power of V1, the standard one, and we take this n tensor power. And the output has n minus two points, so we should associate V1 tensor n minus two. Okay, and we set up this machine where we actually do have a map um, from V1 tensor n to V1 tensor n minus two. Okay, another elementary tangle is this cup map. And of course, to this, we have some algebraic data we could associate, cop i n, goes from v1 tensor n to v1 tensor n plus two, okay? And there are um, two more elementary tangles. So there's two crossing maps, and of course, we're gonna associate um, the cro the, those crossing morphisms I defined before. And to this, I associate cross i n from v1 tensor n to v1 tensor n. And finally, we associate this map. And any, any tangle diagram is, could be realized as a concatenation. You could glue these elementary pieces. Um, I mean, for example, um, this tangle diagram, this tangle diagram is a tangle diagram from three points on the bottom to one point up top, and it's made up of two elementary pieces, that crossing and then this cup. Okay, and so, um, so any tangle diagram D
from endpoints to endpoints could be could be uh, well any tangle diagram from endpoints to endpoints could be um, uh, uh, realized as a concatenation of these pieces. And to each piece, we have algebraic data. And so what do we associate to a more complicated picture like this? Well, we associate the composition of maps. So to any tangle diagram to D, any tangle diagram D. So um, to this picture D, this complicated picture from endpoints to endpoints, we have a map. which I'll call oh, phi of D, which goes from V1 tensor N, goes from N points on the bottom to M points on the top. Okay. Um, I think I'll state the theorem and then maybe I'll come back to that to the question I was asked about trace. So now the theorem of Russian and Toronto Russia Tikin and Tarayo. So, well, I'll state the theorem. It's, uh, it recovers the Jones polynomial in some special cases as a special case. So the theorem is the following. So now let's let T be an oriented tangle. from endpoints to endpoints. So it's a one dimensional object, but we should think of a tangle really living in three dimensional space with fixed, some fixed boundary points on the bottom and some fixed boundary points up top. Okay, so it's really, a, it's a topological thing. And um, what we could do is we could project this tangle onto R2. So we get these pictures, these tangle diagrams that we've been looking at. Okay, so let's let D1 and D2 be two planar projections. And so to each planar projection, um, you have this, you have this, you have these tangle diagrams. And to these tangle diagrams, we associate this algebraic data of phi. And you could worry that depending upon the planar projection, you might get, um, you might get different maps phi, but the theorem is that um, phi of D1 is equal to phi of D2. And I should say there is some correction factor out in front, which I don't want to worry about. But these are equal as maps from V1 tensor N to V1 tensor N. So we have a tangle. So now we have a tangle invariant coming from um, UQSL2. And in particular, if we have a 0, 0 tangle, we have a zero, zero tangle. Well, what is a zero, zero tangle? A zero, zero tangle goes from no points to no points. So there are no boundary points. And so that's actually just a link. So I'll, I'll draw kind of a picture. So maybe um, something like, This goes from no points on the bottom to no points up top. Okay. Um, but this is a, a specific example of a, of a tangle. We have a zero, zero tangle. We have a link. Okay. And we get an invariant of the link. We have a link. And so phi of L is a map from, well, V1 tensor zero zero is the ground field. V1 tensor zero is the ground field. So we have a, a morphism from the ground field to the ground field. That's just an element in the ground field. And this is, this is the Jones polynomial. Okay. 
And um, if yeah, well, if we follow the formulas I wrote down earlier, uh, is you know a very kind of special case is the unknot, which goes from no point to no point, and no, no interesting braiding happens at all. You actually get minus q minus q inverse in the notation in the uh, conventions that I set up earlier. Okay, so this is a definition of the Jones polynomial, um, given completely representation theoretically. And now to get back to this question about trace, um, I was able to define um, the, the Jones polynomial without really mentioning the trace of anything. But if you look at this, um, uh, I guess this is a hot flink that I drew over here. Um, another way, and I don't know if it's helpful for other people to think about it, but if I kind of, uh, let me try to draw it again. This is a, this part of the, of the link. This is a map from V1 tensor two to V1 tensor two. It's some morphism V1 tensor two to V1 tensor two. And there is the notion of a categorical trace. And so you could take the trace of this. It's, it would involve formulas that I've written down before, but it's a slightly different perspective. So you take the trace of this morphism on the representation V1 tensor two to V1 tensor two, and you would also recover the, this Jones polynomial. I don't know if that helps answer your question. So, so, yeah, thank you, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, and I'm about to move into the categorification section, but um, there's some things that I'm, I'm not mentioning. So this is the Jones polynomial. One could also define the color Jones polynomial, and you don't have to do too much more work, but notice that in defining the Jones polynomial, we only use the representation V1 and tensor products of it. If you use these other representations I defined earlier, other irreducible representations, you could upgrade this to something called the color Jones polynomial. And then taking a sum of color Jones polynomials at a root of unity produces this three manifold invariant. But um, I, you know, those details I'll, I'll omit for now. All right. So that's um, kind of a, a crash course in some quantum topology from you know, 1990 or so. And so, um, and of course, quantum topology is, you know, on this level, very active uh, current research. And I mean, it's connected to physics, but now it's connected to quantum computation. Um, so it's, you know, there are a lot of open questions just in the, this classical quantum topology world. Okay, but um, I want to now talk about categorification. and give a flavor for some of it, for some of the examples. Okay, so um, as I mentioned, this is a program due to Crane and Frankel. I think their paper came out in 94. Okay, and so um, it's the, the first description of categorification is not a mathematical, it's not a mathematical definition, it's more of a philosophical um, idea or program. Um, and so the idea is replace, and this is obviously a very imprecise definition, replace algebraic objects by new algebraic objects algebraic objects um, containing more structure. So um, I'll give examples. So again, this is not a mathematical definition, but I'll give examples to show you what um, they meant by this. So a, a kind of a primitive example is if you take a natural number n, okay, there's not much structure you could do just with a single number. Um, but they would say you could categorify this to um, a vector space V such that the dimension of V is equal to N. So I'm replacing just a number N with a vector space whose dimension is N, just like take CN. Um, and a vector space has more structure than just its dimension. There's endomorph it's a whole endomorphism algebra of a vector space. Okay, so, you know, that's, you know, the, in the, this is the most basic example. That's what they, that's how they would say to categorify a number. Slightly, slightly more um, 
sophisticated, but not really. If I take um, a Laurent polynomial, um, whose coefficients are natural numbers, they would say to categorify this by a Z graded vector space. So your vector space breaks up into a direct sum of pieces for each integer. And instead of just taking the total dimension, you could um, record the dimension in a more intelligent way. You could record the dimension of each graded piece. And you would want that the graded, uh, you would want to do that the graded dimension of V is this Laurent polynomial F. Okay. Okay. So that's still, I mean, N or a Laurent polynomial, those are still kind of the lowest levels of things you'd want to categorify. The next level up would be, okay, we want to upgrade a number to a vector space. And what about a vector space? Well, you would upgrade a complex, let's say a vector space over C that has some structure, um, but something with even more structure might be something like a category V. Um, such that the growth in the group of the category and the growth in the group of a category, well, first of all, you have to, you have to be, I'd have to be more careful what type of categories we take, talk about, maybe either um, additive categories or abelian categories, but ignoring kind of these points. The growth in the group of a category is usually a, it's a free abelian group, so it's a module over Z. And so I could complexify it and make it a vector space. And so, you know, forget about this, comp this complexification issue, but basically we mandate that the categorification of a vector space is a category whose growth in the group is just um, the vector space V itself. Okay? And a category has a lot more structure than just a vector space. There's a ton of objects. There's, ha there's HOM spaces between all these objects. Okay, so this is a, a real upgrade in structure. Um, and then a slight modification of this is that maybe instead of looking at vector spaces over complex numbers, maybe we want to consider vector spaces over um, this field. And of course, this field is important because that's we define the Jones polynomial by looking at representations of algebras over this field. UQSL2 is defined over this field. And so you replace um, this type of vector space with a category, a graded category, such that, well, actually the growth in the group of a graded category, which I don't want to get that close into, but it, it's more than just an abelian group. It's actually a group. It's just it's actually a module over um, uh, the ring of Laurent polynomials, and then I could complexify it, and I get this vector space. But anyway, the, the takeaway again of this of this example is that um, of these two last examples is that vector spaces should be upgraded to categories. Okay, and maybe the last kind of abstract example here is um, morphisms between vector spaces. Um, so maybe a morphism phi between two vector spaces V and W. Well, we said that cat that vector spaces should be upgraded categories, and so a morphism between two vector spaces should be upgraded to something between categories. And the most natural thing is we'd want a functor. So a morphism little phi between two vector spaces. She should be upgraded to a functor capital phi between um, two categories. Okay, okay, and so um, I'm I'm going to get back into their topological goals. Um, finding these, doing the, this process, really good actual examples of important vector spaces and their categorifications is, is a challenging problem. Okay, but it is a it is a concrete problem to come up with categories categorifying representations of SL two, for example. Okay, but um, I want to talk for a few minutes about the topological goals, which will lead into um, one of the most successful examples of categorification, which is um, Havana homology. Are there any questions? Okay, so back to a little bit of their philosophy before I get into a kind of a concrete example. Okay, um, so their topological goal 
was that if an algebraic object leads to an invariant of uh, an n-dimensional invariant, so if an algebraic object leads to an invariant of n-dimensional topological objects, For example, um, the representation theory of UQSL2 led to an invariant of tangles or knots. Those are one-dimensional topological objects. Okay. So if an algebraic object leads to an invariant of n-dimensional topological objects, um, then its categorification should lead to an invariant of n plus one dimensional topological invariants, uh, topological objects. And that's consistent with that first um, slide that we saw earlier where, okay, the witten rush can try invariant is an invariant of three manifolds. If all goes well, that should lead to an invariant of four dimensional manifolds. Okay, so I'm gonna give an example, which um, I don't remember if I gave this example, but this was an example which um, really motivated Havana, who's is actually at Columbia. So um, I want to consider the following picture. Okay, so I have these two um, unknots over here. This is an unlink. So this is maybe I'll call it K union K, K for the unknots, just two circles. Okay, and then up top I have just a single circle, I'll call it the single unknot, I'll call it K. And so everything I've drawn so far here, these are one dimensional things, but they're the, this k to union k is the boundary of a two-dimensional surface. I'll call this S. So the boundary of S is k union k on the bottom and k on the top. I mean, there's actually three circles on the boundary, but I'm partitioning it in this way um, just for illustrative reasons. Okay, so S is a two-dimensional thing. Now, we want to try to um, associate some algebraic data to this two-dimensional surface. Well, what do we associate to the one-dimensional stuff? Well, the most natural thing to do is, well, we just learned about the Jones polynomial. So maybe to k union k, we'd associate the Jones polynomial of k union k. Um, property of the Jones polynomial is that it's multiplicative if you have disconnected components. And so and the, the Jones polynomial of the unknot is minus q minus q inverse. So the Jones polynomial of this unlink is minus q minus q inverse squared. And then to this top component over here, j of k, well, Jones polynomial of the unknot is minus q minus q inverse. And then you would want to do something to associate to the surface. Well, we have this algebraic output and this algebraic output, but what could you possibly do in a meaningful way to connect these two things? There's nothing really you could do just in the level of polynomials in any meaningful way. But um, categorification of this does lead to something. So there is a categorification of, um, well, I'll, I'll talk about a kind of a fairly simple algebra. So I want to let A be the following algebra, C bracket X mod X squared. This is a two dimensional algebra. It's just spanned by one and X. And there's some, there's some, uh, there's some things to deal with about grading conventions, but this is a graded algebra where I'll take this to be in degree zero and this to be in degree two. Okay. Now there's going to be a grading mismatch when I, with what I wrote above, but that's a point that, that's something that could be corrected. The graded dimension of a is, well, you count the, you, you make, you count the graded, you count the dimension of each piece and you encode it in a polynomial. So in degree zero, it's one dimensional. So I have one. In degree two, it's one dimensional. So it's plus one Q squared. So that's the graded dimension of this algebra. And that's extremely close to this thing over here. It's, I mean, what's important to notice is that Q and Q inverse are off by just Q squared, which is essentially what's going on here. The negative signs are something else that could be taken care of. But um, morally speaking, we could now upgrade this quant, this Jones polynomial of the unknot, 
to this algebra A. Okay, so this is a categorification of that thing. And similarly, we could categorify this by A tensor A. The graded dimension of A tensor A is the graded dimension of A times the graded dimension of A. So it categorifies this. And now A is an algebra. And an algebra has a multiplication structure. And so now we could have something very meaningful. We could have the multiplication map from A tensor A into A. And that is something that we could associate to the surface. Okay? And so that's, this is a, I mean, it's an elementary example, but this is an example of what Crane Frankel had in mind that um, if you categorify some algebraic data to something of a higher level, you could then recover some topological information. Okay, so um, while this is kind of an elementary example, this, was in the, this construction leads to Havana homology. Okay, so I, I, um, I have a few more things to say, but I don't know what time I should end at, so that will affect me a little bit. Um, uh, you can, we're, we're, we're kind of open-ended, but you should be, you know, wrapping up. We, we, we have the Zoom till 8.30, so that's okay. not an issue, but, but um, anyways, go okay. on. Okay. Okay. It's interesting. Okay. It's an education. So, um, okay. So, um, uh, so there's this construction due to Havanov, um, where he upgrades the Jones polynomial to a homology theory. And um, essentially, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say the rough idea is that, so you have this, um, the way he did it is that you have a link. So a link has n crossings, let's say. Okay, there's two types of crossings. Um, and for each crossing, you could resolve a crossing in two different ways. You could kind of smooth it out, get rid of this kind of, uh, just get rid of the crossing. One thing you could do is you could just straighten out like that. Another thing you could do is you could smooth it out like that, okay? So to each crossing, there's two possible ways of resolving it, all right? And so if there are n crossings, there's two to the n possible resolutions. Is and, this also done with Vassiliev invariance? Is it the, the, the same type of... Uh... Yeah, oh, you mean this, this idea of resolving the crossings? Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could have also defined the Jones polynomial just by resolving the crossings um, and avoided all the representation theory vessel too. But yeah, then the facility of there is also. Um, and so the point is, is that when you resolve, when you resolve um, all the crossings, what you're left with is a collection of circles. Oh, I shouldn't have raised that. Okay, so after resolving the crossings. And again, there's two to the end possible ways of resolving the crossings. Um, we're left with a collection of circles. And I have an example just to show you what I mean for the hop link. And then I'll get to the punchline. Each way you resolve, you always get to the same number of circles? No. Okay. And we'll see that for this uh, hop length example. Okay, so, um, and so I, I label, sorry, I call one of them the zero, yeah, I call this the zero resolution and this the one resolution. Okay, so if I do a zero, zero resolution, you get um, two circles. If I do a one, zero resolution, I get one circle. If I do a zero one resolution, I get one circle. And if I do a one one resolution, I get, well, I get two circles again, but that's not, doesn't accurately capture how it looks. Okay, and so, I mean, this is also how Kaufman defines the Jones polynomial, his version of the Jones polynomial, he, he resolves it. And to each circle, he assigns something like Q plus Q inverse or one plus Q squared. And so then what Havanov does is he says, well, you should categorify that. So for each circle, the algebra A. So here I have two circles associate A tensor two, A tensor A. Here I have one circle, so it's A. Here I have A. Here I have A tensor two. 
And we have maps between A and A, A tensor two and A. So there's a multiplication map. There's a multiplication map. And there's actually the algebra A is a Frobenius algebra. There's a co-algebra map, so called delta, and delta, and I think you need a minus sign somewhere. And this is actually a chain complex. Okay, and so it's a ch chain complex and you can take the homology of it. Take homology and you get what's called the Havana homology of this link L. And so his theorem is that um, this is a link invariant. And you could take the Euler characteristic of, um, you take the Euler characteristic of homology. There's an extra grading here. And if you take the Euler characteristic of a graded, of, of a, a complex of graded vector spaces, you get back a polynomial. And so the graded Euler characteristic of Havana homology is the Jones polynomial. So this is his famous categorification of the Jones polynomial. And it's fairly elementary. Um, so maybe just in the last couple of minutes, um, I'll say that this, so this was the first construction and it's probably the best construction and it's the most computable, but um, this has been uh, reworked in various, from various areas of math, from algebraic geometry, there's a construction of this, um, from representation theory and Lie theory, Lie theory, there's a construction of this. So um, in my thesis, um, there's a construction of uh, a categorification, it's a theorem. So the, the Jones polynomial is an SL2 link invariant, it's based on the representation theory of UQSL2. Um, there's a UQSLN invariant. So there's a categorification of the UQSLN link invariant. I mean, Havana have also constructed one of these using slightly more sophisticated techniques than just this. Um, there's a categorization of the UQSL2 link invariant using um, so-called category O. This is category O from Lee theory. And so um, I did this in my thesis and then um, Mazur, Chalk and Stropel, they also constructed this in a in a sort of a dual way in something called closure duality. Okay, and so this is, so um, just to wrap things up, um, so this idea of constructing these link invariants from various areas of math have brought many different, have brought algebraic geometers together with um, representation theorists, together with symplectic geometers, because there's now many, many constructions of Havana homology using various techniques. And there's been some very nice um, applications um, Rasmus improved uh, conjecture of Milner that was only, that was proved by um, using very sophisticated techniques of gauge theory, um, just using kind of Havana homology, a very combinatorial thing that you know, if I just had you know, another hour, we could really get a hold of very, very nicely. And so um, for future perspectives, so now the question is, okay, this is, how could we upgrade, how could we upgrade this Havana homology into now an invariant of three manifolds? And so this is the area that I work in now um, we have to use some other categorical techniques, things from DG theory, differential graded theory. Um, and so uh, in recent work, I, um, with the collaborator Yu Chi, we categorified the Jones polynomial specialized at a root of unity, but um, maybe this is a good place to, uh, to stop. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker. Can, can you just say, say what, why the jo why the um, co the categorification of the Jones polynomial is better? In other words, does it invariant more things? Is it is it closer yeah. to a true invariant? So it uh, yeah. So it it distinguishes knots that the Jones polynomial couldn't distinguish. Um, so it's, it's better. Yeah. But it's not a universe. It's still it's not a universal one. No, no. Um, uh, there is so. Uh, so yeah, so one answer is that it is a better invariant. It's not a universal invariant. It's not a perfect invariant. Um, uh, there's also, a, there's, a, there's an old conjecture of Jones that the, um, that the Jones polynomial detects the unknot. Anything whose Jones polynomial is the unknot is the unknot. Um, that's an open conjecture. Um, Kronheimer and Rafka proved using symplectic geometry that um, Havana homology detects the unknot. So that's kind of interesting. Um, also, um, Jones polynomial, sorry, Havana homology gives rise to an invariant of knotted surfaces. That's kind of what I was going at when, I, when we looked at that pair of pants. 
So it could be upgraded now to an invariant of knotted surfaces. So this is a new invariant of a higher dimensional thing. Um, and that led to this proof of this conjecture of Milner about um, some genus of, of some knots. Is there, is there a hope that perhaps you could say that um, this construction uh, could lead to uh, a, a full invariant if you uh, took, uh, let's say, a family of quantum groups or maybe, I don't know, like just arbitrary, because I mean, once you even go to quantum groups of root, a root of unity, you might, you know, start getting some more uh, interesting representations. I know that, you know, some people are actually trying to do this because it's non simple and somehow representations yeah. may become a bit more, uh, a bit more interesting. Um, so, so, I mean, I, I, I don't know what, what happens. I mean, is there a hope that to say that if you take this, uh, you know, these categorifications and, uh, and, you know, map them into all, let's say, you know, finite dimensional half algebras or who knows, like a certain family of quantum groups that maybe there's uh, some kind of, a, so some kind of, a. I mean, it's possible. I, I tend to doubt lots of things. I know. I mean, it's, it's yeah. even, I mean, I, I wouldn't, yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's possible. I, I, and these are the types of questions I haven't thought of, so I don't have the best intuition for that type of question. My guess is no, but I would not be the best person to ask about that. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, maybe there's even some sort of a universal construction that somehow, you know, some, some, some sort of a, I don't know, silly universal construction that says, okay, this kind of very strangely constructed half algebra may be uh, completely recovering, uh, you know, some sort of an adjoint functor that, that makes uh, recovering of, an, of a certain knot uh, fully possible, but just by, but then it would be kind of artificially constructed depending on the actual knots. I mean, that, that might even be a possibility. I'm, I'm just kind of asking, you know, what's the, you know, if there's yeah. some, some sort of hope or going to a certain direction of family of, of quantum groups, um, uh, or if it's just, I, I don't, I don't know. And I don't know if anybody's like thought in that direction. Mm -hmm. yeah. can, can I ask one, one other question? Is there oh. such a thing as two categorification? In other words, uh, why, why make it into a category make it into a two category or something like that? Yeah. So there's right. So, um, what I didn't mention at all is, anything about UQS, I didn't mention UQS2 in terms of categorification in the last like 20 minutes or so. Um, there is a categorification of the quantum group UQS2. UQS2 is an algebra. You could think of it as kind of a one category in some sort of kind of degenerate way. And there is a categorification of UQS2. Um, so UQS2 gets categorified into a two category. And this is due to, um, well, for the SL2 case, this was due to Aaron Lauda. And then um, for SLN, this was due to um, Havanov and Lauda and, um, and Rukier, independently. Um, and so there, so there are two, ca and I, if I had more time, I would have talked a little bit about this Lee theoretic construction. And there is kind of a two category floating around. Um, it's where the, the objects are some, the objects are something like, um, are, it's just some number and um, the morphism, the one morphisms are functors and two morphisms are natural transformations. And that's a perspective that you could, that you could kind of embed this whole Havana homology into. So the answer to your question is yes, there is a two category lying around here. Um, it's just a little difficult to, in the time to explain what it actually is. And is it a better invariant or is it a conjecture no. to be a better invariant? No, I mean, so this, this Lee theoretic invariant, um, it had the possibility of being a better invariant. There's, there's more structure in this Lee theory, in this, these Lee theoretic categories, but it was shown, I think, by Stropel to show that it contains exactly the same information as Havana homology. So it's, it's good for like kind of a conceptual point of view to have these two categories around, but it's not clear that there's any real topological advantage. Do you know if, um, may I ask? Yeah, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's kind of a philosophical question about categorification. If we take this example of uh, Kovanov, right, with pair of circle and one circle and cobordium, so, so we have uh, like uh, John's polynomial for pair of circle and for circle, and then the question is why we cannot just map this one polynomial to the other? 
and why we need to add more structure if there is some general reason or something. Right. I mean, so, okay, so I'll answer your question backwards, right? When we do categorify, we have something very natural. We have a math from A tensor A into A. Yeah. If we're just given two polynomials, I mean, this almost, I mean, yeah, philosophically, like, I mean, of course you could maybe like add the polynomials or divide the polynomials there, but there aren't, those aren't really natural things to do. And what's really going on is like, if you just think of a polynomial as just like a number, a number by itself doesn't have any structure in its own right. There aren't, you know, numbers aren't categories, right? There aren't morphisms between them. So maybe that's kind of a reason why we shouldn't expect to be able to just stick with Jones polynomials to associate something to the surface. So just a uh, quick kind of unrelated, I, I should maybe know this because I've seen, I think I've seen uh, Aaron talk about this even when I was at USC, but do you remember if they, if the categorification that they have for the UQSL2, does that capture just the algebra structure or is it, uh, do they have some additional ca uh, structure of the category that also capture more like the co-algebra or something? Uh, um, I don't think their original construction captures, for example, the co-algebra structure or, you know, um, but I do think that in maybe recent work of Mannion and Rukier, they have some ways of capturing well, maybe the, almost the full Hopf algebra structure so that you could categorify tensor products of representations in a kind of a, in, a, in some sort of formal way. But I don't think in the original work, I think it's just a categorification of UQSL2 as an algebra. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are, there are like halves of these algebras, like the upper half of UQSLN. And there, there's halves of two categories. Um, and there, they actually do, they do categorify the upper half of UQSLN as a bi-algebra. But for the full thing, I don't think that their construction does that. So that, that, that would be kind of a unusual function of something from C to C tensor C or some, or, or C. Uh, right, I mean, uh, the, something to categorify the, the co-algebra structure is yeah. probably a bit un unusual. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. jo Josh, make, it, make the pitch again for that talk on Friday. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, so first, I'll, uh, um, I'm going to put the, uh, I'll put the link to the CUNY representation theory seminar in the chat, in case uh, anybody's interested. There okay, but, a lot but, of but send me an email with it, and then I'll send it out to everybody also, before, send oh, okay. it to, to, to tomorrow. And, okay, um, sure. yeah, and so the talk on yeah, go on. Oh yeah, so the talk on Friday is about um, and it's not categorification; it's quantum invariance in this other current direction by Marco Dorenzi from Zurich. Um, there'll be another quantum topology talk on March twelfth. It's about Trivero invariance, um, and then in the uh, in the Meg Revers colloquium, which I'm the organizer of, um, I'll put that in the chat now, and I'll also send it to Nelson. Um, there is a, there's a quantum topology talk on March 10th, but then there's another categorification talk on April 7th. So in case anybody's interested, you know, there might be some overlap of things there. Yeah, I'll send it out. Also, I wanted to say next week, we don't have a talk in the, in the New York Category Theory Seminar, but two weeks from now, we have March 17th is uh, Tobias Fritz is talking about categorical probability and the Definati theorem. So that, that, that could be interesting. So we're not going to meet next week, but the week after we will. Okay, everybody, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. It was a very, you, very man. educational. I, well, I got a, I, a tremendous amount. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, for thanks, thanks, Josh. Yeah, please, great talk. Please. Thank you. Okie doke. Take care, everybody. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Good oh. to see you.